this is PT Pro Talk, the podcast for physical therapists who want to improve their clinical skills and be more successful. I am Ariana Parks, physical therapist and our host, and today we interview Laura Kivo and Brian Allen to learn about APTA's advocacy. We discuss how it works and how it shapes policies, current legislative issues that the APTA is addressing, how the APTA formulate its positions, what the role of a lobbyist is, and what strategies we can use to ensure our voices are heard by the Congress, regulatory agencies, and commercial payers. Laura is a APTA grassroots and political affairs specialist, and Brian is a congressional affairs specialist at the APTA. If you find this information valuable, please subscribe to our channel, hit the notification bell for updates, Give us a thumbs up and share this episode with fellow clinicians who feel my benefit from this conversation. Thank you for tuning in and we hope you enjoyed the show. PT Pro Talk is only possible with the support of the forward-looking and innovative companies like Fitter First, your first choice for the best Canadian-made rehab and fitness products since 1985. Remote therapeutic monitoring sounds great but also difficult. Sarah Health makes RTM simple and easy for your patients and providers. Check out sarahealth.com to learn more. Hi, Laura. Hi, Brian. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you doing today? Great. Great to be here. Uh, doing well, Ariana. Thank you so much for having us. Awesome. So let's start talking a little bit about yourself and, and your career and what do you do so our audience gets to know you a little bit. S sounds good. All right, Laura, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm Laura Keevil. I'm Senior Specialist of Grassroots and Political Affairs here at the American Physical Therapy Association. I've been in this role since April of 2019, and I have over a decade of grassroots advocacy experience, starting at the Arthritis Foundation, where I was there for six years. Then I went to the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, where I worked on their legislative fly-in, and now I'm here at APTA, and I just love connecting people with their members of Congress and letting their voices be heard with um, those with our legislators. It's really important. So, Brian, take it away. All right. Well, thank you so much, Laura. So, my name is Brian Allen. I am a Congressional Affairs Specialist here at APTA. This is my colleague, Percy, who has decided to join us. <laughs> So I have been at APTA since January of 2022, so just short of two years. But prior to that, I spent about five and a half years on Capitol Hill, where I made it up to legislative director, aka head of the policy team for a member of the House. So as a Congressional Affairs Specialist for APTA, I'm one of our full-time lobbyists, So that means, and I know we'll get into this a little more later, that I can do anything from answering a question our members might have about a bill all the way up to helping policymakers write the bill itself and really everything in between. So again, I wanted to say uh, thank you to Mariana for having us on. You know, we're really excited to do this. We were talking about it pretty excitedly yesterday. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. So... Let's get into it. So how does APTA advocacy work and how does it shape policies? So there's a lot of different ways that it works out and both of us work on different areas of our APTA advocacy work. So connecting APTA members with their members of Congress is what I do. So getting the physical therapy voice heard with legislators, educating them about physical therapy, taking opportunities to meet with legislators, from our APTA members is really important. And if they don't know how physical therapy works, then they could pass laws that are detrimental to the profession. So it's our role to make sure that doesn't happen and monitor what's going on on Capitol Hill, 
um, in other areas too, with our regulatory advocacy with uh, government agencies and making sure that um, government agencies are making rules that um, that also hear the physical therapy voice as well. So uh, the the role of of our advocacy work is really important because it is what shapes the national policy. Go ahead, Brian. Well. You know, Laura, I think you actually did a great job of laying a lot of the groundwork, giving me a little less to talk about here, which is, you know, very disappointing. I do like to hear myself talk, but really I want to zero in on what Laura said for how our advocacy work, really one specific thing, namely relationships. It's all about relationship building. So in my day today, like I kind of mentioned a little earlier, I do the technical work. I'm the one who makes sure the legislative language makes sense. I'm the one who's regularly talking with senators, members of Congress, and their staff to promote our issues with them, but to, you know, also help them move forward in an informed manner when something does concern PT. So obviously, I am building my relationships as well. But even more important than that is our members building relationships with these policymakers. When I was on Capitol Hill, my former boss actually had on speed dial a panel of experts in his district in various fields who he would either call or text when a bill concerning their profession came up. So that's one of our big goals and something Laura does a fantastic job with is building up what is often referred to in our industry as grassroots, but really building up our members' understanding of policy while helping them build those relationships with their policymakers. So that really drives a lot of what we do. Very good. And what are some of the current legislative issues that the APTA is actively addressing now? All right. Well, I would be happy to field that one. You know, we have, good Lord, about 14 different bills that we've either endorsed or have been the lead on. That number could be a little higher right now, now that I think about it. So for the sake of time, I'll focus on some of our major issues right now. And first and foremost, given it's that time of year, unfortunately, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the physician fee schedule. Now, we're obviously looking at the equivalent of a 3.25% cut in the reimbursement rate. And we know right now that's not tenable. It's not tenable for any healthcare provider, which is actually why APTA is a leading member of what's known as the Fee Schedule Coalition. And that is a coalition of essentially every provider group that takes Medicare in the United States. So that's small groups all the way up to our fellow leaders like the AMA or the College of Surgeons. And this is something that we've been a central part of for years now. We're working with our partners, both in the coalition and with Congress, to find a permanent solution to this yearly roller coaster because it's just again it, it's not tenable and more importantly it's not fair to our providers who don't know what their reimbursement rate is going to look like any given year i mean that's that's insane i couldn't plan my life out not knowing what my salary for lack of a better term was going to be next year So that's something that we have been and are committed to finding a solution for. Then as to other issues that are really solely in APTA's camp, need to talk about uh, HR 4878. And for those of you that may not be uh, too familiar with congressional numbering systems, that is actually referring to the number of the bill And if you're interested in finding more information on it, we'll talk about our website, I know, a little later in the chat, but you can go to congress.gov and type that in. Again, that's HR 4878 to actually look at the bill text and get a breakdown of it if you're so inclined. And this is what's known as the Empower Act. It's a bill that's aimed at correcting really a long overdue oversight from CMS regarding 
supervision of PTAs in outpatient private practice. Now, I could probably write a book on why this is in place, but to summarize, CMS has just not caught up with the evolutions the PT profession has had in the past three decades. And because of that, PTAs in outpatient private practice under Part B have to be under direct supervision of a PT in order to see patients. And by that, I mean the PT has to physically be in the building, which given technology and the fact that everyone has what 30 years ago would have been a supercomputer in their pocket is a little silly. So this legislation would instruct CMS to just defer to state law because every jurisdiction in this country, except for New York and D.C., allows for general supervision of PTAs, meaning that the PT just has to be on call. So this is a bill that we're particularly excited about. You know, we have a version in the House and in the Senate, actually. And we don't know if an end-of-year package is going to materialize yet, especially with there being a new Speaker of the House. And by that, I mean a large healthcare oriented bill. But we are keeping an eye out for it. And if one does materialize, this would be the number one item we're trying to get in. And then another really important issue, and one that's registered personally with our members and with our students, actually, is increasing awareness of the importance of pelvic health, particularly pelvic health physical therapy. And this bill is H.R. 2480, the Optimizing Postpartum Outcomes Act. And this bill would do three main things. The first thing it would do is it would instruct CMS to take a look at and issue best practices for pelvic health programs to state Medicaid and CHIP agencies. The second thing it would do is have the Government Accountability Office, or GAO, conduct a study and see where gaps in healthcare coverage might be. And for those of you who don't eat, sleep, and breathe this like Laura and I do, the GAO, or Government Accountability Office, is essentially the federal government's HR department, and a little bit of the legal, too. They're the ones that do audits to see what the government is doing well and what it could improve on. So that's why they would be the ones taking a look at it. And finally, the CDC would actually issue information on pelvic health and the importance of pelvic health PT and other services to providers and pregnant and postpartum individuals. And so you can tell by listening to it that the name of the game with this bill is increasing awareness. And we've actually found that there is a real lack of awareness of the not just the importance, but even the availability of pelvic health PT and other pelvic health services, both with providers and with pregnant and postpartum individuals. You know, the story I always tell is right after this bill was introduced back in March, a good friend of my wife's and mine was actually staying with us because she was presenting at a couple of conferences in D.C. And she, by coincidence, this was also right around the first birthday of her first child. Now, when we were discussing this bill, she actually noted that she had a difficult pregnancy and after giving birth was having some mobility issues. But during her six-week postpartum, her OBGYN never even mentioned pelvic health PT to her. And in fact, she had to find some exercises from a Mommy and Me Facebook group. Now, this is a woman who has a college degree and is working a white-collar job. She's an above-average, sophisticated patient. So if a patient of above-average sophistication can't find these services... What about the less sophisticated patients? So that's also why we're looking at Medicaid and CHIP as well. And this is a bill that you know, we're excited about and really that our members are excited about because I don't think I've ever presented on this to a group of our members without at least one person coming up and telling me the 
a very similar story about how they needed these services and couldn't find them or how their spouse needed them and wasn't able to find them. So uh, our community has really gotten behind this. In fact, I know Laura will likely talk about this program later, but this was the bill that our PT students selected for their flash action strategy this year, which is a two-day social media and advocacy blitz. And we had just under 4,000 letters go to the House in support of the bill. So this is really something that people are passionate about and that we're excited about as well. And now I could go on and on with this, but I know we do have some other topics to talk about. So I will yield back to you, Mariana. Okay. A few questions about everything that you just said. So like on the, on the cuts that you mentioned, the first uh, about Medicare. So who decides that? Like, is that a law that they're trying to pass? Like how, how, how does, does that work? So... Unfortunately, these cuts are an obligation that CMS is required to undertake. There were were essentially balanced budget negotiations that took place decades ago, and CMS is bound by them. And one of the reasons why we need to find a more permanent solution is because they are legislatively bound to make these cuts happen. And they are going to happen sooner or later. You might see through APTA media or just on the news in general that these cuts aren't discussed as rolling back. They're discussed as being delayed. So eventually this is something that is going to come down the pipe, which again is why it's not tenable and we need a more permanent solution. But yes, Although it might feel that way sometimes, CMS is not out to get practitioners. They are just doing what they are bound by the law to do. Hmm. And what is like our power on that matter? Like, can we really do anything? Oh, you most certainly can. You most certainly can. And the way you can do that is to advocate and to let your policymakers know that this is an existential issue for you. And one that requires a permanent fix. You know, again, I had mentioned that this is a massive priority for APTA, for AMA, for the College of Surgeons, for really every practitioner group under the sun. We are all working on it, but the best thing you can do to help us in that is to reach out to your policymakers, to your senators, to your representatives, to their staff, and to tell them just how huge this is for your day-to-day life and for your ability to treat patients. I mean, we have plenty of members telling us that they're looking to get out of Medicare entirely just because of these cuts and the looming uncertainty. Now, we are aware that, again, this is an ongoing yearly crisis and one that just cannot continue. So really, make your voices heard, reach out to your legislatures, and and tell them how much this matters. And please take the time to tell them your story, not just that this is something that's going to affect you. And the reason why it's so important that you tell your stories is that while Laura and I can provide all the technical support in the world, we can't tell them what it's like to treat patients and how these cuts are impacting our ability to do so. So that's what is important you tell them. We can provide the technical support, but we need you to tell your stories. Yeah, and I want to add in that we have our action centers. We have our legislative action center for APTA members. And then we have a public patient action center for patients, the public, supporters of our work, where you can send a letter on this issue to members of Congress. And in the past, I think, three weeks that we've had it up, we've had over 22,000 emails on this issue go to Congress, which really equates to about 7,500 people sending letters to Congress on this issue. So it's getting massive, massive support. And Congress is hearing us, and we got to keep that up, and we have to keep the energy up. And 
contacting Congress is a great way to be able to to talk about these issues. And as Brian said, we have the technical language in those letters, but it's up to our advocates to add in the personal stories that really help move the needle. And Brian, when you say a permanent fix, what do you mean by that? So we've been exploring multiple options to try to address this issue. One that has been floated is potentially pegging reimbursement to the MEI, the uh, Medicare Inflationary Index. And really, we think that's a great solution. It would you know, keep your pay really on par with the inflation rate, which, you know, right now is still pretty high. So even without the cuts, we understand that Medicare reimbursement is not going as far as it used to. You know, that's something we've been talking about with our partners in Congress, and we're exploring options. But those are the kinds of solutions we're looking at, really a, pay, a permanent way to get off this yearly roller coaster of, you know, cuts and reducing, cut, reduce, cut, reduce, and, you know, with rollbacks in between. So solutions like that, permanent market-based ones. Okay. And so how does the APTA formulate its positions on different matters? So I can actually talk about that. So well, APTA formulates its positions actually at the start of uh, every Congress. So we have what we refer to as PPAC, which is the Public Policy and Advocacy Committee at APTA. And so PPAC is actually a group of member physical therapists who are put in place by our board, which is also comprised of PTs. And they actually advise and consult on setting our policy agenda for each Congress. So every two years, APTA actually puts out its public policy priorities document, which is readily available on our website. And that is done, again, through the direction of PPAC. And that it sets our goals for the year. You know, if you look at it, a lot of them are overarching. So essentially, we get our general marching orders. My team does and my department as a whole, and we use that information, again, from our member PTs to determine the best way legislatively to proceed. So those are the parameters in which we operate, and they set what we do. So at the end of the day, we're a member-driven association, so our instructions have to come from the members we serve. Good. Very good. And I want to add to, um, we have our state leads and our component leads. They're called federal affairs liaisons, and they help coordinate advocacy efforts within their state or their, their uh, chapter or section. And we meet with them monthly and we listen to them. And if they have any kind of, if they're hearing any rumblings of issues that we need to be addressing, that's another way for us to hear about what's going on. And they're really part of the boots on the ground and making sure that we are ahead of anything that could be coming down the pike. Okay, very good. And then, Brian, I think that's for you. Uh, what is the role of a lobbyist and who represents APTA as lobbyists? I'm not sure if you already answered that one in the beginning, but go for it. <laughs> so, of course. So... I'll do the second question first, just because that's a little quicker. So we have a, a really a five-person team, at least as far as federal advocacy goes, directly with Congress. The ones who you would consider are doing more lobbying and lobbying adjacent work. You obviously have myself and Laura, but you also have Justin Elliott, who is our VP of Public Affairs. He oversees everything really to do with policy work. That's both regulatory and congressional. Then you have Mike Matlack, who is a uh, director of government affairs, and he oversees our PAC, our political action committee. Now, I'm sure we'll discuss that a little bit later, but our PAC is essentially what allows our team to do a lot of what we do to get us directly in front of members of Congress. So we rely on donations from members and 
I want to make it clear it's donations. Legally, member dues cannot go to our PAC, but this PAC allows us to attend events in exchange for donations sponsored by senators and members of Congress. So that gets my team and actually very often our members a seat at the table, often a very literal table, with the policy members to have a chance to do a small group or in some cases a one-on-one discussion. So that's very important work for advocacy efforts. And then I have another uh, counterpart, actually, Steve Klein, who is the other congressional affairs specialist. So he and I are the two full-time lobbyists. The other folks I have mentioned have other duties. And we actually have a a full health policy and payment team that deals with advocating for APTA in front of the executive branch, you know, CMS, um, HHS and other related agencies, and actually commercial payors as well. You know, I, uh, I obviously not being on them can't speak to their day to day, but in our, in our cohort, say for lack of a better term, there are about a dozen or 13 individuals whose full-time job it is to make sure that PT is represented in front of Congress, the executive branch, aka the agencies, and commercial payors. And as for what you know, we do on a day-to-day basis, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but there really are no n- normal days doing what we do, because as people who deal with Congress, we have to operate the same way Congress does, which often means we're dealing with an uncertain schedule and we're chasing the news cycle. But really, it's my job to make sure that the issues that are important to APTA are effectively managed and advocated for. So, I do have what's called an issue portfolio, which uh, is essentially a list of items that are important to our members that I am in charge of. For example, I am in charge of our pelvic health efforts. So that means I'm the point person on that. However, I have to be up to date on all of the issues that matter to our members even if I'm not the lead on them, because you never know what a policymaker or their staff is going to ask me when I see them any given day. I need to be able to speak on all of our issues. So again, I had mentioned this earlier, I can do anything from asking a more technical question one of our members might have about a bill or an issue, all the way up to crafting legislation myself. Uh, For example, well, Mike Matlack and I worked very closely with the original sponsor of our Pelvic Health Bill, as well as our Pelvic Health Academy, to craft that legislation. And so it was our job to make sure that, one, the legislative language made sense and would pass legal muster, but two, and honestly, more importantly, it accomplished what our members needed it to accomplish. So really, if I had to describe what I do in one sentence, I make sure that our members' needs are being met in front of Congress. And, you know, Laura and I say this every presentation, but, it, you know, it's my job to get a seat at the table for us, because if you're not at the table, you're on the menu in D.C. And, you know, I know it's very pithy, but it's also very true. Because if I don't, if I don't, and honestly, our members don't make their voices heard in D.C., we can lose out. You know, we can lose out of access to federal funds for certain programs or, you know, be forgotten when changes are made. Things, you know, things like the fee schedule, you know, scope of practice issues and the like, you know, we need voices up there to tell policymakers that these issues are important. So, you know, really, that's what I do. That, and if you couldn't tell by this point, talk a lot. <laughs> Laura, anything else to add? So the work that I do is really in tandem with the work that our lobbyists do. So they're really up on the Hill talking to members of Congress day in and day out, 
and I'm sending APT members to do that and have that constituent voice. Without the two, it doesn't really work as effectively. So to have that that voice of people that actually vote for that member of Congress is really important, along with our technical side of how this legislation would work. So having an APT member talk about how this legislation would impact their practice, their patients, the work that they, that they do is really important, um, but it, they really coexist together and, and we can't be effective without each other. Yes. And how can we effectively engage people in APTA's advocacy efforts? So I will actually, <laughs> I will yield to Laura okay. on this one. This is her wheelhouse, so it's time for her to take the lead. <laughs> so there's a lot of ways that we can effectively do this, and it all depends on the campaign that we're working on, what time of year it is. Right now, at the end of the year, there's often large legislative packages that are being passed through Congress. We also have to look at the congressional calendar. So at the beginning of the year, it's typically pretty busy for members of Congress. In the springtime is where we can really be effective with legislator visits. And actually in 2024, we are hosting APTA Capitol Hill Day, uh, April 14th through 16th. It's for APTA members to meet directly with their members of Congress on Capitol Hill. So on the 15th, we'll have a training all day for members, uh, APTA members, talk about the issues, get them prepared for their meetings the next day. And then on April 16th, they'll actually go up to Capitol Hill and meet with their two senators and their representative to talk about the issues and have that constituent voice and have that relationship with those members of Congress. In the summertime, it is, again, very busy all the time. <laughs> I feel like we're always saying, oh, it's so busy because it really is. And the congressional calendar is pretty relentless. So we also take advantage of recesses, congressional recesses throughout the year. So there's always a spring recess and try to get APTA members to meet in the district with our members of Congress. But the biggest one of all is August recess where Congress gets out of the heat and humidity of Washington, D.C. and goes back to the district for a district work period. And members of Congress tend to tour the district or if they're senators, they tour the state and meet with the constituents and get that voice and be able to have that time to take to meet directly with their constituents. So we always try to get APTA members to get on that calendar for members of Congress and have them go to their clinic and actually see what PT is all about and how it impacts the communities. And that's such an impactful time because having the that, that time with the PT is really important. They often meet patients. They often do tours of the PT schools or clinics. Um, but those are really impactful for both the legislator and the clinic. And then towards the end of the year, again, it gets really, really busy with, with those end of year packages and getting things wrapped up because the House cycles every two years. So next year, we're getting into an election year, a presidential election year, which is even crazier. And uh, we'll have some Senate races as well. But the House is up every two years and, you know, they have to be voted back into their position. So it gets crazy to, to make sure that those bills, as Brian mentioned, you know, that we have the bill numbers every two years when there's a new Congress. If the bill doesn't pass in that Congress, they have to be reintroduced. So next year, you know, we hope that to get a lot of legislation passed and um, if it doesn't get passed, then we work to get them reintroduced again. And uh, something we like to dispel a lot of myths of how the whole, how this all gov this government affairs actually works. And it often takes a lot of Congresses, a couple Congresses to get legislation passed. It is normal. Uh, I can count on one hand how many bills I've seen passed in my entire career because it does take years. I can, uh, I can actually jump in on that a little bit too, Laura. So that's such a good point because the average lifespan, as it's called, of a bill from when it goes to the first time it is introduced to when it is passed into law is two to three Congresses. So that is four to six years. But the most prominent example that I like to talk about, and actually one that does matter to PTs, is the Lymphedema Treatment Act. Now, this was passed last Congress, but the Lymphedema Treatment Act is legislation that, and as the administration works through it, will allow for Medicare reimbursement for compression garments designed to treat lymphedema. 
Now, this is a bill that at its height had, I want to say, 75, 80% of House members on it, maybe higher, and a majority of the Senate as well. But it took, if I recall correctly, eight Congresses, which is 16 years to pass. And oh yeah, my it, gosh. yeah, it's... It is wild. I mean, age. <laughs> again, Why? Um, yeah, I am. Uh, that's actually a very good question. Why? And the the number one reason why is not that anyone was opposed to it. You know, obviously, with all the sign-ons, it was a pretty popular bill. It's just that Congress deals with, for lack of a better term, so much noise constantly. So on average, there will be between 10 and 12,000 bills introduced in the House of Representatives each Congress. So of course, there is no earthly way they can deal with that much legislation. Yeah. And on top of that, you know, they're dealing with crises that might be happening suddenly. Like, you know, for example, the the war in Ukraine or the crisis in Israel that suddenly demand close to their full attention. And so things can just not be considered due to everything that's on Congress's plate. You know, again, Lymphedema Treatment Act was a very popular, very, for lack of a better term, innocuous bill. But it just didn't get taken up because Congress was dealing with so many other things. And in fact, you know, even more remarkable, the bill didn't pass on its own. You know, Laura talked about large legislative packages. It was included as part of a massive, you know, 2000 plus page bill. So it didn't even pass on its own. It just got thrown into something and happened to pass. And again, you know, that's after 16 years of primarily mm. grassroots advocacy. So things can take a while here. Yeah, I always say that advocacy is a marathon and not a sprint. It most certainly is. <laughs> yeah. Um, Laura, I think it was very cool what you said about having the members meeting with their representatives. I didn't know that. So I think that was very cool. And... I just imagine like when the Congress changed what you mentioned and you have to build those relationships again. Yes, <laughs> <So like> yes. <laughs> and another thing to kind of throw into the whole mix are committees of jurisdiction. So because there's such a volume of issues that Congress takes up, the House and Senate have different committees that help bring bills with different topics through. So for health care, it's typically the House Energy and Commerce Committee, which don't ask me why or us why it's through that committee. It just is. If it moves. Well, I can, I can answer that. I hate to interrupt your flow, Laura. So, so this essentially comes from what's known in the constitution as the commerce clause. Namely, if an item moves in interstate commerce, it falls under the jurisdiction of Congress. So if it is, if it's a service across state lines, or if it's a good that moves, or even if it's electricity or water, it can fall under the jurisdiction of the Energy and Commerce Committee. That's why it is often referred to as the Committee on Everything. <laughs> it's very true, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's really important to have those relationships with those members of Congress who sit on these committees of jurisdiction, because they can help push our bills through really effectively and they have to clear those committees before they're considered by the full Congress. So there could be a member of Congress that our members get to know that is not on the, a committee of jurisdiction, but it's really important to get to know them because eventually they could be put on one of those committees of jurisdiction. On the flip side, we could have a member of Congress that's been on a committee of jurisdiction for a long time and then they choose to retire or they lose a primary or otherwise are not in Congress anymore. So then we have to build that relationship all over again. But you just never really know where those relationships will come in handy of who will actually be on those committees and um, throughout their congressional career. So 
no matter what, it's important to get those relationships going with any member of Congress, but particularly those members of Congress is super important. And since I so rudely interrupted Laura earlier, <laughs> I'll finish up with what we you know, often called the big four, our committees of jurisdiction. So in the House, again, you have the Energy and Commerce Committee because it's the Committee on Everything. And then you have the Ways and Means Committee in the House, which is the committee that directly oversees Medicare. And then in the Senate, you have the HELP Committee, the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, fun little acronym, and then again, for reasons that would take too long to explain in a couple of hours, much less in the time we have remaining, you have the Finance Committee as well. And congressional jurisdiction has changed and morphed over the two plus centuries of Congress's existence. So you just sometimes end up with strange jurisdictions like that. Okay. Oh, you just had a lot there. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and talking now about practical terms, so like what are strategies that we can use to make sure that our voices are heard by Congress, regulatory agencies, commercial payers? Yeah, so it's just contacting them. So using the tools and resources that we have. So for APTA members, as I mentioned before, the Legislative Action Center, we have the pre-written letters that have kind of the technical side available, and you can add in your personal story and send that to your members of Congress. Again, we have the Patient Action Center for the public that has a little less issues on there than uh, for our member benefit for the Legislative Action Center. But that's really important, and donating to PT PAC is really important. Only APT members are able by law to donate to PT PAC. Um, so, in, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary of PT PAC this year in 2023. But that gives us so much access that is needed to members of Congress. And I know political action committees can sometimes get a bad reputation, but again, if we're not at the table, we're on the menu. And that's just another way that if we're not there with a PAC, there are other organizations and other groups that have PACs that would be getting their voices heard where we wouldn't. So it's super, super important to have a robust PAC. And um, also, we also have a program called the Key Contact Program, where it's APTA members that form and build relationships with their members of Congress. So the groups that we do have um, members of Congress visit during August recess, that's typically our Key Contact Program. And you can find more information about this program on the APTA website. The only prerequisite to become a key contact is to be an APTA member. And we provide advocacy trainings throughout the year. We have quarterly trainings where key contacts hear from us. And we give them an assignment to help them build that relationship and have something to outreach to members of Congress and their staff. And it's really important to have that staff connection, too, because staffers have the ear of their member of Congress on different issues. So we encourage our key contacts to build relationships with the health legislative assistant. And um, yeah, it's really important with that. We also have supplemental trainings for our key contacts throughout the year, just to help build their civic education, to kind of give them a behind the scenes look about how Congress works and how they're able to fit into the system and have their voices be heard effectively with Congress. And but I would. Uh, go ahead, Brian. Oh, I'm so I'm so sorry, Laura. I, what I was what I was going to say was I I'd also be remiss if I didn't put in a quick plug for our advocacy app. Now, this is a tremendous tool that anyone listening, actually member or not, could download right now. APTA advocacy. You can find that on the Apple App Store or I believe it's the Google Play Store. I'm pretty firmly in Apple's ecosystem, but. Now, this app is a fantastic tool because it lets you take a look at all of the bills we are working on, but, and this is my favorite, you can actually look up your senators and your member of Congress, and you can click on them, and you can see which of our bills they have co-sponsored, aka added their name to in support, or which ones they have yet to. And if they haven't, you can then use the app to actually send them a letter requesting they do so. So it's an amazing tool, one that, again, anyone can use, totally free. 
And, you know, I, I'm a pretty big fan of it, so I try to plug it whenever I can. Awesome. That's very good. Um, that's one of the questions I had. If there is people here that are listening, there are no members, what can they do? So the app is one. Anything else? Check out our Patient Action Center for sure. It's super easy. It takes three minutes to send a letter to Congress. And um, I used to be one of the people on Capitol Hill answering the letters. And every day we would log what the letters were about. And then my my boss would ask for, you know, what are people calling about? What are people sending letters about? And we would give a rundown every day about what they were talking about. So, you know, if there are, say, 10, 20 people in a district that are sending letters about physical therapy, that's actually a lot of people. And that would rise to the top of what the members should be listening to. Um, also, interacting on social media is really important as well. We are able to effectively tell our advocacy story on social media and have that visibility with the members of Congress to tag members of Congress in posts about physical therapy and how um, how physical therapy impacts the patients that you work that you serve. Um, but that education piece, as I've said before, is super important because not every member of Congress is aware of physical therapy about aware of what physical therapy does and how effective it is. And uh, that's really, I would say, 50% of the work that we do is just to educate members of Congress about PT. And that is, that's actually so true to piggy off, piggyback off of a couple things that uh, Laura said. So educating members of Congress on physical therapy issues is very important because while I know your listeners and all of us here live this stuff every day, you'd be surprised how many legislators don't know much about physical therapy. So when I talk to a policymaker or their staff about PT, I generally get one of two reactions. Either they or someone in their immediate family has had PT, it's changed their lives and they love it. They love PT. They love the work you all do, they love the inherent cost savings associated with it, or they've never dealt with it much and they have no earthly idea what PT is at all. And there's really no in between. So getting the word out there is really important. And as someone who also at one point in life, longer ago than he'd care to admit at this point, had the same job that Laura did going through constituent correspondence, these letters really do matter. If we got a double-digit amount of letters on an issue, that meant that our office was sending them a formal letter, making them aware of the issue, potentially sharing some of our boss's thoughts on the matter, and really would be something that we would prioritize going forward. And if someone took the time to write a personal piece of correspondence we would take the time to personally contact them back, be that a directly written email from staff or in some cases even a phone call to talk about the issues with them and get a better understanding. And then trust me, if I had a phone call with a constituent about an issue, say a PT issue, you would be sure that my boss would be hearing about it. So, Staffers pay attention when that stuff comes in, and it really, really matters. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't just go into a vacuum. You know, we have all these tools and resources that are actually effective and are essential for getting the vo our voices heard with Congress. Yeah, I'm sure people think, uh, some people at least think, they're like, oh, I'm going to send an email. It's just going to be one between many or many, many emails that people received and it's not going to be addressed. And probably that hearing you say all of that, I think encourages people to do take action and, and, and make sure that that makes a difference. You know, it, it's so true because a lot of people feel that their legislators are unaccountable and you know, given the state of our chaotic world right now, I understand why they feel like that may be the case. But at the end of the day, these are public servants and their constituents are the public they serve. So if someone takes the time, again, 
someone who is, for all practical intents and purposes, my boss, took the time to send me a personal letter or a personal email or placed a personal phone call about an issue that mattered to them, you better believe that I and the member I work for were listening. Oh, very good. Um, so members, I think that's for Laura. So if they want to go and find those templates, those letters on how to send to their representatives, how they can find that is inside the APTA platform. Yeah, go to APTA's website and uh, just search for Patient Action Center or Legislative Action Center. You'll be able to find it right away. I know we have some links for our Patient Action Center up on our main page because of the Medicare issue. And uh, yeah, take a couple minutes and send a letter to, to your members of Congress about this issue, especially Medicare. That's what we're working on here at the end of the year. But uh, for APTA members, check out the Legislative Action Center because we have so many other issues up there. I know Brian mentioned we have like 14 or so issues. We have a lot of issues that we work on. And uh, we have a lot of our letters up there in the Legislative Action Center for people to learn more about those issues and to take action on them. I also recommend that people check out our position papers. We have, if you search at the top of the APTA website for position papers, that site will come up. And we have position papers on our a lot of our main legislation up there ready for people to read about and to send those, those papers to their members of Congress and to educate them about these issues. But those are great resources to learn more about the work that we do. And, um, you know, all of this works together. So we're giving these position papers out. Our APTA members are giving these position papers out to members of Congress. We're having people write in on these issues. Um, we're having people tweet at their members of Congress, send messages through social media. So all of this is an ecosystem that works together to make sure the voice of physical therapy is heard on Capitol Hill. Awesome. Any other resource that you recommend, Brian? Anything else? I mean, Laura covered the one last thing I was going to talk about, which is our position papers. You know, they they give you a glimpse into what we are thinking on and really how we will be talking about the bills. You know, I and the members of my team actually write those. So they are coming from us. So sharing those with your senators, with your members of Congress is a great way to reinforce what we are saying. So to send that along and to, again, couple it with a personal story, you know, something like, hey, I would really like it if you would consider supporting H.R. 2480, you know, our pelvic health bill. You could either say you could speak to it as a pelvic health PT or, you know, if, you know, you are someone who has given birth, if you've had a child, you know, that's also an important voice as well. And, you know, I know we've talked about it, but that's also a great way for non-members to advocate as well, because there are for example, plenty of non-PTs who have given birth and have dealt with complications from that. So really it's use those tools, but combine them with your personal story and congratulations, you are already an extremely effective advocate. Yeah. And I also want to mention, download our app. You know, we, you can access both action centers on there. We also have talking points on our issues. You can see what bills of ours, your members of Congress support or don't support or not yet support, I guess. And uh, yeah, it's a fantastic resource to have on your phone. And, you know, we're on our phones constantly all the time. So it's um, a, a great way to advocate for the profession and a super easy way to do it. I also recommend for APTA members to save the date for our, our APTA Capitol Hill Day, April 14th through 16th, as I mentioned. We'll have more information at the beginning of the year, and her registration opens up in January. So uh, be on the lookout on our website for more information about that. But that is an incredible event. And most people, if they've never advocated before and they come to this event, that is what sells them on advocacy forever because it is so impactful. It is just a game changer to be walking the halls of Congress and meeting directly with their your members of Congress and their staff to, to advocate for these issues with others in the profession. So it's a super powerful experience. We make sure that you're all set up for success by training you. 
on uh, on how to be an effective advocate. But um, highly recommend that you all join us. And I think the last thing I would add to all of this is to if you have an issue, contact us. In fact, you know members can reach out to us at advocacy at apta dot org. Again, that's advocacy at apta dot org. And that will send an email that will go through our system and actually get sent directly to the person whose issue area it is. So again, if someone has a question about pelvic health and you email advocacy at apta.org, within an hour or two of you sending that email, it is in my inbox and I am answering it personally. Because at the end of the day, we are a member-led and a member-driven association. If you don't tell us what's on your mind, we can't effectively advocate for you. So please, you know, do not hesitate to reach out is really the last thing that I would hammer home. Very nice. Um, before we wrap up, anything else? Your voice is powerful and it's very effective and your advocacy really is important. And I can't stress that enough that your voice really does matter. Advocacy is also a lot easier than you think it would be. Mm -hmm. Five to ten minutes of your time, say on a lazy Sunday afternoon in our advocacy app, or five to ten dollars, you know, the price of a cup or two of coffee to PT pack makes an incredible difference. So really just a small amount of time, money, or effort adds up in a big way and allows us to keep advocating at the top of our ability for you. Very good. Thank you so much, Brian, Laura, for coming here and sharing all this information that I'm sure a lot of people um, didn't know much about it. So I'm glad to have you both here and spread the word and help our profession. So thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Well, of course, thank you so much for having us. Mm -hmm.